the future of teaching, how best to support educators to be leaders of learning in times of uncertainty. Please welcome our moderator for this session, Dr. Andrew Cunningham, Global Lead Education, Aga Khan Foundation. Finally, our session about the future of teaching has arrived, and we could not be more thrilled to be here. Can we just give it up for teachers all around the world and how they are making a difference in rewiring education? Fantastic. So everyone can please be seated. Yes, over there. And Gwen, you're just Thank here. You. Fantastic. Thank you. It is an honor to be with you today to moderate this high-level panel about the future of teaching. How best to support educators to be leaders of learning in times of uncertainty. Thank you to the Rewired Summit, our friends at Dubai Cares, and all of you for making this session today an extraordinary one. In short, we as a global education community must do more to ensure that teachers are the key constituency for co-creating the future of education together. We know this is true for many reasons, but two big ones stand out. First, from personal experience. Every one of us in this room and around the world knows that we are here thanks to the teachers who valued us, respected us, and loved us. The second reason is we know it from research. Over and over again, the global evidence is unanimous that investing in the quality of teachers is one of the most important factors for improving learning outcomes in the 21st century. But do we know how to truly rewire education through genuine co-creation with and for teachers around the world? In response, two years ago, a coalition of visionary philanthropic partners, Dubai Cares, the Oak Foundation, the Lego Foundation, Jacobs Foundation, IKEA Foundation, Wellspring Philanthropic Fund, the Atal Social Foundation, Portugas, and the Aga Khan Foundation, collaborated with educators and education system partners to create a new global initiative that places teachers at the heart of achieving SDG 4 by 2030. This is called Schools 2030. And in 2020, one week before the pandemic broke out, this program launched in partnership with 1,000 government schools across 10 countries to support preschool, primary school and secondary school teachers to lead new ways to assess, design, and showcase what works to improve learning outcomes for all. Each year, teachers against all odds across these 10 countries produce 1,000 teacher-driven solutions through a human-centered design process that responds to the contextual realities of their classrooms in some of the most challenging contexts in the world. One context in particular, the government of Kampala in Uganda, a country that, where the schools have been shut down for two years, one of the schools that partnered with Schools 2030 was called Upper Secondary Prison. Working with teachers who are responsible for helping the young inmates with short sentences to acquire the literacy, numeracy, and most importantly, those attitudes of self-worth and self-awareness to be ready to re-enter society after their sentences. This is the type of unlikely alliances that Rewired has brought to the stage. We have witnessed teachers throughout schools 2030 in the 10 countries in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, India, Portugal, and Brazil in bringing teachers 
at the stage of system leaders. And we're excited by Schools 2030 global partner 100.org, who will later this afternoon launch a new offline and online portal called faved.org, where the emerging solutions from these 1,000 teachers, but from any teacher around the world, can be uploaded, exchanged, and faved. It's sort of the new like button in, I guess, the uh, meta universe uh, from Facebook. At the end of the program in 10 years, Schools 2030 is seeking to create more than 10,000 new actionable learning solutions by more than 50,000 teachers across 10 countries, strengthening this elusive link between schools and systems and systems and schools. I was a fifth grade teacher, so I'm used to having a clipboard in my hand. And this is why our friends at Dubai Cares, as the first founding members of Schools 2030, have invited us here to celebrate more examples of how we as an education community can better ensure that all of our approaches to rewiring education are rooted in the triple C approach. Constant co-creation with teachers. I'm thrilled, therefore, today to be joined on the stage with teachers and teacher educators here and also virtually from Uganda, India, Ghana, and Lebanon in direct conversation with some of the most senior leaders of the premier international development organizations of Teach for All, the Aga Khan Foundation, Plan International, and Save the Children. All four of the organizations on stage share a common commitment to co-designing global education programs with teachers, valuing teachers as the leading experts in the room, and dare I say, the education policy entrepreneurs for the world. We are excited, therefore, to kick things off with our first pair of conversation that will be emphasizing the importance of teacher leadership and innovation in times of uncertainty. It is a privilege and honor to introduce now Khadija Bakhtar, the Chief Executive Officer and Founder of Teach for Pakistan, and Mr. Emmanuel Chimuli, an educator from Teach for All in Uganda. Over to you, Khadija. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. Good afternoon. Throughout the pandemic, we witnessed incredible teacher leadership from educators who work at the front lines of our education systems. And we saw and we talked a lot about the, the digital divide that was keeping the vast majority of kids across the world from learning. And when we, we look at what was happening within the Teach for All network, we saw so many examples that showed us that when it comes to overcoming that digital divide, technology is not the driving force there. It's the leadership of teachers who understand this work and, and the needs of the kids who they're working with the best. And I have the honor today of being in conversation with one such incredible leader. Emmanuel, welcome. Thank you. I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about what was happening in March 2020 when the pandemic hit and you were teaching in your village in Senda. Take us back to that moment, please. Yes, thank you. I'm excited to share this. Uh, as a locally rooted and globally informed educator from Uganda, I am fully convinced that uh, the only way out of poverty for my learners deep down in rural Uganda is education. So when the pandemic hit and the president announced the closure of schools, I knew that uh, the learning of my learners was lying in balance. So in my village without electricity and access to internet for all, almost all learners, uh, I knew that I had to innovate uh, and to keep them learning. Uh, so, so I had to use what, what was actually available. So for me, what was available was not internet and electricity. All I had was a pen and paper. So I immediately went to work and started writing learning packets uh, for, for my children to, to, keep, to keep learning. So I knew that I couldn't do it alone, so I engaged the community leaders and uh, uh, informed them to mobilize the parents to keep sending the children to, 
pick the learning packets that they were supposed to complete from their homes uh, and then return them for review, after which they would be issued another learning packet. So through that approach, my children kept learning, and I'm glad I stayed when schools were closed. What fantastic resourcefulness um, and, and adaptation that was needed in the moment. What did you do next? So, yes, they are deep in the village in rural Mayube, rural Uganda, but I know that they exist at a time when technology is driving everything in the world. So I am really concerned that they get access to the digital skills as early as possible. So in the, in, on one hand, I was issuing out the learning packets and keeping them learning. But on the other hand, I was also figuring out how do I accord them access to the digital tools. So in the process of, 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 of researching about how to accord them access to the digital tools, I actually came across an opportunity to work with a group of high school students in the US who, who are called the student change, change makers. So the student change makers at that time were actually planning to fundraise and uh, avail tablets for learning for, for schools in Uganda. So when I came across that opportunity to me, it was a heaven sent opportunity for my children and I, I worked with them and we were able, they were able to fundraise and get 29 tablets for my school and two solar panels to power them. And as I talk now, my children can learn both digitally and non-digital and it's really exciting. Wow, that's fantastic, Emmanuel. And I think we have a photo also of those digital resources, if we can put that on the slide. Sorry to interrupt. And this is, I mean, it's so fantastic, but I have to say, you make it sound so easy to get tablets and get, and, and start to use technology for learning in a village that has no electricity. What were, what were some of the challenges that you faced along the way, and how did you cope with them? Yes, so uh, getting the tablets surely sounds easy when, you ask, when, when I'm saying it, but uh, along the way, I, I think there was need to put so many things together. So like in this school where almost all, all buildings actually don't even have windows, don't have doors. So basically all this had to actually be put together for me to be sure that the tablets would be, for example, stored securely and then be used by the children. So, so, so because of the so many challenges, uh, I, I figured out that uh, at that point, uh, I w first of all, I wouldn't give up because I want my children to have a brighter future at all costs. So I knew that I couldn't do it alone. So at that point, I called upon the parents to stand with me and we put everything together so that at the end of the day, we, we could achieve what we wanted to achieve. So the community came in, renovated the building, and uh, so when the tablets came, they were secure. They are secure even now, and the children are learning. Their skills are improving. There is accelerated learning for them, and to me, the future is brighter for them. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a lovely example of just bringing so many people together to solve a problem that everybody really cares about. Um, and so, Emmanuel, now when, when you look at your kids using technology, what is, how do you see it working for them? What, what has changed for them? Yes, uh, technology is good, and we really need to be concerned that our children are using the technology in learning. But I think most importantly is that we have to first develop their foundation skills in numerous and literacy first. So when the tablets came and then they were using them, I actually came to realize that we needed to invest more in the foundational skills. So when the tablets now were available, uh, bef prior to using the tablets, we actually did more remedial lessons to ensure that they were up to speed with the foundational skills. But then after actually getting them better equipped with the foundational skills, you realize that when you give them the tablets, one, they own their learning. It is exciting to use the tablets. It is. For them, it is, it is actually a new experience. They enjoy it. And because of the excitement, the, honestly speaking, they learn at a faster rate using the, the tablets. But of course, that happens after equipping them with the foundation skills. Right. Yes. And I know we're almost at time, but what's next for you and your students? Yes, I, I am so convinced that my children can compete favorably in, in, in this technology-driven world and I want them to get the real skills. So my dream for their community is that there will be a real computer school 
to equip them with the digital skills for work as early as possible so that maybe one day it, sh it should be them to set up uh, a center like Dubai Exhibition Center, but in Uganda, because I know it is possible for them. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Manuel. And um, thank you for reminding us, I think that even when we're thinking about how do we support teachers, thinking specifically about how do we invest in their leadership and how do we really empower them to understand what's needed on the ground and then act resourcefully, um, that's what, what the need of the time is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's give a huge round of applause to Emmanuel. I also understand that this is Emmanuel's first time outside of Uganda, so I think you are the ambassador for your school and also the ambassador for champion teachers throughout the country. I just want to see a show of hands. How many of you had a favorite teacher? Now, raise your hand if you have seen that teacher on a stage like today. We need all of those teachers to be on the stages just like Emmanuel today. Thank you very, very much. So I'd like now to invite Ms. Rashmi Prabha to join us virtually from Bihar, India, and turn the conversation now to our second topic around how might we be thinking about effective approaches to contextual and flexible funding for creating spaces for teacher innovation. So to get us started, I'm thrilled and a little nervous since he's my big boss, and honored to introduce Mr. Michael Coker, the general manager of the Aga Khan Foundation, and Ms. Rashmi Prabha, a teacher educator. Hi, Rashma. From Bihar Teacher Training Institute in India. Over to you, Michael. Andy, thank you. You're, you're doing pretty well so far. <laughs> Uh, thank you for welcoming us uh, today, uh, and warmest congratulations to all of our friends at uh, Plan International, Save the Children, Teach for All, Teach for Pakistan, uh, gathered here for ensuring the teacher leadership just you know remains as it must at the heart of our approach to improving the quality of education worldwide. I, I don't think that there's much room for debate that beyond the family of a child who is more fundamental and central to their life uh, than a teacher. Uh, the Yaga Khan Foundation is, is privileged and humbled, uh, truly, uh, in its work over the last five decades, supporting hundreds of thousands of educators uh, across Asia, Africa, Europe, uh, in, in quite challenging uh, learning environments. Our thoughts today, our collective thoughts, are with the, the girls and boys, the women and men of Afghanistan. Uh, uh, Th through the leadership uh, of these educators, uh, we have supported millions of learners to achieve quality education uh, by first listening to community needs. And we'll hear more about that uh, in a moment. Uh, Andy mentioned Schools 2030 is one of the ways that together we're co-creating the future of learning with educators. Uh, could not be more excited about this initiative. Uh, at the heart of the programming is something we call the Flexible Response Fund. Uh, it's a vehicle. Uh, where local communities and educators themselves decide uh, what's most needed to help their children stay, come to school, stay in school, have fun in school, thrive and learn. It's been recognized by the UN Girls Education Initiative, PWC among others, as a global best practice. And we've been able to roll this out in many countries even before Schools 2030 launched with, with, with great success. Uh, our biggest lesson so far is one that is both uh, patently obvious and too often ignored. Uh, we cannot predetermine what educators need to help students that they know best. Instead, we have to foster long-term shared journeys of collaborative design, meaningful support, and actionable innovation to help educators succeed against steep odds. That's why we are most fortunate uh, to have today uh, Ms. Rashmi Prabha from Bihar, India on the stage to help us better understand uh, what we need to consider in supporting teachers uh, to be leaders uh, in learning in, in times of increasing uncertainty. Ms. Prabha, welcome. Uh, we're very sorry you can't join us uh, in person, uh, but we are thrilled to have you with us today on the big screen. Uh, uh, Ms. Rashmi, uh, uh, Ms. Prabha, can you hear us? Let's just do a, a quick sound check. Yes. Very good. Yes, sir. That's helpful. Uh, Ms. Prabha, please, first question today. Let me, let me kick things off by asking, uh, uh, as a teacher and educator in India, you've taught a great many students the art of teaching. 
uh, what makes a good teacher? And uh, t you know, how do you teach teaching, please? I have invested my 12 years in working at primary and elementary education. And from last 15 years, I am working as a teacher educator. I have experienced that expectations of society is changing from time to time with respect to the political, social, and economical aspects. This pandemic has changed this expectation very rapidly. My response to the question that what makes a good teacher and what kind of teachers we need for future is based on my experience that I have working together with different types of teacher. Some teachers are in this profession with their choice, but some are in this system without any interest. For a teacher educator, it is a big challenge to give opportunity to all of them so that they may develop a vision to you, their capability in finding the solution of their day-to-day -day problem in local aspects, but a new approach. We want nature lover teacher and digitally equipped human teacher. I can share one example of human de center design workshop of school 2030 program. There I observed that teachers were engaged with their peers in finding the problems in local communities. This was very joyful and meaningful because they were trying to find solution in their with local context and the solution was based on their real experience. The process for this design were based on their interaction with peer group and local public. This critical analysis of case study and interaction with local people gives an idea for innovative work. I feel that a reflection, collaboration, and co-orientation are very effective for managing innovation, for encouraging the community, for doing for their betterment. I appreciate School 2030 team that they have these ideas in the center of their discourse. Ms. Prabha, thank you. That's a wonderful answer with a number of illustrative examples. I, I, I wholly agree with you and I think speak for the group uh, that your emphasis on the need for, for more co-creation is uh, qu quite inspiring and fundamental. However, as everybody in this room knows, as you know best, uh, as I know, teachers are equal parts busy and overworked. Uh, how can we actually create more time and space for teachers to, in fact, be innovative, please? We need to work more on social emotional learning and managing academic emotions at every level. I must appreciate a human-centered design which gives opportunity to discuss on local issues with local peoples. I can share one example of recent innovation, the learning wall. This solution was innovated during lockdown when all the normal functioning of a school system were to totally collapsed, completely closed, few numbers of government school team and school 2030 team were engaged in a discussion that what a school is. And they reached to a conclusion that a school does not mean a physical structure only with certain few other infrastructures. The entire ecosystem where we learn is a is part of a school and the simple thing which helps in meaningful learning activities is a part of that system. 
In my example, a simple wall is the innovation. In a group, after discussion, they take a decision to use a simple wall for learning activities. And accordingly, volunteers share a foldable whiteboard on wall every morning with, under the heading, they write a puzzle or a question. The local community people started to gather near that wall and they discuss to solve this problem. Nearly all the community member, members, the elders, the youngers, the children, the ladies, all we are very interested in these activities. They take it every day, they gather in, and they wanted to solve those puzzles in this way, that simple wall encourage them to solve problems in community. These activities were very joyful and meaningful. Such kind of innovation promotes teachers to design new strategy for better output. We need to provide more exposure to teachers for newness in their working process. I believe that innovation comes from confidence, passion, and, and reflection. For this, we need collective approach to work on a simple line, which helps our community. Ms. Rob, I, I very much like the, 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 this notion of the learning wall and the woman in front of me in agreement and giving you the thumbs up sign. Uh, you know, it's simple, it's powerful, and it's a, an example of this concept of learning as an ecosystem, where you bring it to the community, where, where it's alive and dynamic. And it's pretty easy to picture families, uh, other community folks, children, sort of assembling around that learning wall on a given morning or an evening and talking with these kids about what's going on. Uh, uh, extremely powerful, certainly as uh, Ms. Rabba, we, we only have a few minutes, but you have the, the ears and rapt attention of all the education decision makers in the room today, please. What message would you like to leave with them? Teachers need friendly and flexible environment to opt new practices in their day-to-day -day work culture. They may do mistake, but we need to take it as one step forward towards better output. This will improve their confidence level and to be output-oriented teacher. We need to respect them and attach and enable them so that they may respect their profession. We are co-passenger in this journey where our goal is to make this society equitable, sustainable, and happier. Work together to develop human teacher who can take care of climate, concept, and children with their own interest. This requires a long-term strategy and, I, and lots of patience with commitment. Thank you. Thank you so much. You, you really are an inspiration and a champion. You know, as a parent, I, I am Without question, certain, my, my, my sons would be very lucky to have you as a teacher in their classroom. And we are very grateful that you joined us today. Andy, back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Let's give a huge round of applause to Rashmi. I mean, let's also discuss what it's like to talk to the world through a camera in also a different language. Just imagine a language that you're not used to every single day and trying to make a global speech. I think we don't listen enough to teachers in their local languages. We will have our last speaker be speaking in Arabic for our last session. So if you do not have a headset, follow the uh, example of Gwen to make sure you have one and make sure that they are passed out. So now turning to our third conversation, and it's about effective approaches to teacher training and mentorship to support quality learning in equitable education. I just wanna make sure that the energy in the room is actually what a fifth grade classroom might be. 
Can everyone just stand up for teachers? Stand up, who stands up for teachers? Excellent. Who actually puts two thumbs up into the air for teachers? Who also does actually four thumbs up for teachers? Pump, pump. Excellent. Thank you for sitting down. So now over to our third pair to introduce Dr. Tangina Mirza, Chief Programs Officer for Plan International Canada, together with Charlotte Adinku, Master Teacher and Trainer and Education Team Manager at Plan International Ghana. Over to you, Tangina. Thanks. Thank you so much. You are doing such an amazing job of coordinating this. I'm just loving it. Thank you so much. Um, uh, one of the important things with this COVID pandemic has shown is that it has not been an equally affecting everyone. And although with this two year shutdown, we saw the social economic impact of the COVID was enormous. It showed us how unequal this world is. The impact has not been same everywhere. And it is more so for girls. 20 million girls who have been out of school during this pandemic, many of them may not even get back to school ever. There will be a high risk of early pregnancy, early marriage, early pregnancy, and all the gains that we have seen in the last few decades in reducing the gender parity in education could be gone. The, the long-term gains we had thought about girls being the social, political, economic opportunities in their life could all be gone. So this pandemic has been a real eye-opener, not just as a health epidemic, but the social economic impact on gender inequalities has been a tremendous one. Going back to the main topic of teachers, teachers are the main backbone of an education system. Teachers are also responsible for making sure the barriers the girl face in school can be reduced. Women, female teachers are role model for young girls to look up to say, and I can become a teacher. So the teachers, female teachers especially, play a tremendous role in making sure the girls are not only coming to school, but are staying. So they have a huge power to break down the stereotypes of girls not going to school. So in this journey, I would love to introduce my colleague here. Her, as we know, her name is Jen, uh, Charlotte Adinko. She's a master trainer in one of our most innovative projects in Ghana, funded by Dubai Cares. And big thanks to Dubai Cares for hosting this amazing uh, session here. They also funded this project. So I would love to ask Charlotte, can you tell me a little bit more about this project and how did you actually pivot during the pandemic in Ghana? Okay, thank you very much. So um, we had a project T for T that's trained for tomorrow, funded by Dubai Cares that uses satellite technology to reach out to 20 training colleges across the country. So we have a studio, so you can have one teacher being able to reach out to so many schools at a time. And we use satellites to do that, to train teachers. So during the pandemic, it, it came all of a sudden. Schools had to close down. And that was the time that I really saw how important it is um, to use technology to reach out to learners and teachers across the country. So as a teacher and already using the technology, it was an opportunity for me to train my fellow teachers on how to develop digital content and it was also um, a time that I realized that we teachers, um, we really need to know and learn and to have the opportunity of how to um, develop digital content. Charlotte, because, is that you? Yes, that's me. Oh. So it gave me the opportunity that I was able to train my fellow teachers. So now it's moved beyond just a project and it became national such that the, we partnered with the Ministry of Education, with Plan Ghana, and we had more teachers on board, and we gave them training on how to develop digital content. And the country also set up a learning TV, a whole channel, just to broadcast lessons to learners at home. 
So now we went beyond just the project, and it was the whole country. And these teachers were trained on how to develop digital content, not just developing digital content, but ensuring that um, it's best spoke, we met all teacher standards, issues of gender, which plan international we don't overlook at all. Because the content you are developing, you should ensure that the images are on point, the choice of words, how you deliver the sessions and everything. So we had that, I had that opportunity to train more teachers and within a month we were able to record 420 videos which was being aired on the Ghana Learning TV and that was national. And learners could still connect, be at home and still enjoy lessons. We made the lessons so basic, um, very age appropriate, and we were able to reach out to over five million basic school learners all over Ghana. <laughs> and aside um, reaching out to learners, it was also an opportunity to be a role model to other teachers. So I'm just not teaching, I'm just not training teachers, but teachers watching you on the screen at home, learners watching you at home, you are a role model to them. And I realized that both teachers and learners having the opportunity to see somebody modeling, somebody um, being able to reach the expected standards that is expected of them as teachers. So they were not just home, but in terms of CPD, it was still being developed as they were, they were in the house. And I was so excited to have some learners, they'll call you, Madam, I saw you on TV, I'm following your lessons, and they'll have a thousand questions to ask. And it was quite exciting. So we, we, we still had that contact with our learners through the technology. And I realized that we teachers, we really need it. Because it's a different thing to teach face to face, to have the learners with you. And it's a different thing to stand in front of camera, record. It's also a different thing to have a um, few learners in your classroom, maybe 40 people in your class. And now you are teaching the whole nation. And the project Dubai Cares funded, that was how far we were able to reach during the pandemic. Yeah, thank you so much, Al, for sharing that. Uh, you mentioned one point about role modeling. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Okay, so um, when it comes to role modeling, there were aspects that um, you'd be surprised that you have learners in your community who haven't seen a female doctor before or they've not seen a female police officer before, or a military officer before. So it was an opportunity to bring some of these role models to have interactions with them. Mm. They, they can relate, they can ask them questions, they share their real life experiences. For them to know that the, the challenge I'm going through, somebody also went through it and has made it so I can make it. We realize that the various um, subject areas that teachers find it, um, learners find it challenging, it's possible the teacher is also having challenges in that. So to have um, a math expert coming to talk to the teachers as a, as a, a, a subject expert, the teacher is able to guide them, share experiences, and we realize that these are things that raise the aspirations of learners a lot. That they, they can see it, they can relate, and they want to be like that. They even want to be something more than that. And it was a very good experience for both the teachers and the learners. Thank you, Charlotte. I also wanted to know, I know a part of this project was funded by the British government, and it included girls and boys clubs. What was the role of the teachers in these girls and boys clubs? Okay, so we had this project called MG Cubed, which was funded by the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDU, the UK government. 
and um, we had a club sessions. And these club sessions, um, we had we started with the girls, just girls, because MG Cubed making Ghanaian girls great. But with time, we realized that no, there are some things you can't get the girls unless you carry the boys along. So we added boys to it. So we had girls, we had boys, and then we had the mixed sessions also. So there are some things we want to just talk about it as girls, girls. And there are some things we want to talk about it just boys. And there are some topic areas that both um, sexes come together. And issues that um, in our culture, parents find it challenging to discuss at home issues of sexual reproductive health, issues of abuse, gender-based issues were all discussed at these sessions. And you get girls coming out to share their challenges. You have the opportunity to support them. And their teachers are also trained on how to touch the lives of these children. When the pandemic came, we realized that um, Topics such as psychosocial support was very key, was very key. Because as planned, issues of gender, um, handling children with distress, is a key thing that we do. And we ensured that um, they coming back to school, even after the pandemic, they, the distress they have, the unanswered questions. As a teacher, how do you handle them? Even if they don't say it, how do you identify it? How can you perceive that my children need this, they need that? Because it's not just learning literacy and numeracy, but you need to also touch their lives such that they will have you in their hearts and um, in times of challenges and anything, they can reach out to you. So their teachers were also trained in these aspects, which was after school and it's, it's, it's one of the, it's an aspect of the project that um, really had a good impact on them. Where you even had some girls who are dropped out coming back to school just because of the club sessions that we had. Because it allowed girls who have dropped out after school to join the other girls and boys in school for these club sessions. And it was a good experience. Thank you, Charlotte. We could listen to her for hours, but we have a time constraint. But what it all demonstrates is the importance of teachers in the lives of the students. And one thing I really want to say, and maybe because my mother was a teacher, financially, they're not that well paid. We had a very hard life growing up. Nobody talks about having good salaries, good training. These things need to be important, discussed now, high time, because if we want to attract talented, smart teachers, their salaries, ongoing training, innovation is critical. I think it's high time we talk about these things. And having seen that myself and teachers like uh, Charlotte and many others, we have seen they need to be supported. They need to be uh, during the retraining phases, innovation and the flexibility is key. So thank you so much for this topic and thank you to, so much to Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you so much. Imagine one teacher influencing and informing and inspiring five million students. I don't even know what kind of salary that deserves. But another round of applause for Charlotte. Thank you so very, very much. So now we turn to our final conversation. And please, for those of you who are not fluent in Arabic, please do ensure that you have your headsets on, as I will be doing quite uh, shortly. Um, so I would like to introduce our last pair in also having our conversation about how do we promote, building on this topic, Tangina, how do we promote teacher well-being through co-collecting and co-analyzing data. And I'm thrilled to introduce Gwen Hines, CEO for Save the Children, and with us virtually, Ms. Nagam Baidun, an educator from Lebanon. Over to you, Gwen, thank you. Thanks so much, Andrew, and thanks to all our brilliant teachers today, and very excited to have Nagam with us online from Lebanon. You've heard today just how transformational teachers are for the students, for the parents, for the wider community. 
as Save the Children, we very much believe that, and we work through what's called a common approach across the 120 countries we work. We have proven approaches that work with policymakers and teachers to make sure teachers get the support they need, because otherwise it can be a bit lonely, it can be challenging, as well as the issues others have mentioned. So the well-being of teachers feels really important to pick up in this discussion. And just to say, it's very easy to think that COVID is a one-off. But of course, many teachers are dealing with tough circumstances. As Emmanuel said, lack of electricity, Charlotte talking about Ghana. Well, Nagam's going to talk to us about the situation in Lebanon today, which is incredibly challenging. So Nagam, let me turn to you. And can you say more about what life is like for a teacher in Lebanon at the moment? Thank you. Uh, well. First of all, thank you very much for hosting me. I will explain briefly the situation in Lebanon and the crises we have. Lebanon has a very exceptional circumstances we haven't witnessed before. We have, uh, uh, with the education uh, sector, other sectors are suffering, like every sector. So we have the pandemic that uh, uh, aggravated the problem of education. Also, of course, the crisis has been very negatively impacting the status of the households in Lebanon, including the Syrian refugee families and the Palestinian refugees. We have early marriage and we have uh, child labor as well. Let me tell you about the, um, uh, the uh, low level of the uh, Lebanese lira and uh, the deterioration of the purchase power of uh, the Lebanese people because of the higher prices um, to unexpected levels. The cost of education in Lebanon is very, very high now, and uh, we uh, and the schools increased their fees, and the increase was between 30 to 50 percent, and in some schools, the increased um, fees amounted to 70 percent. Um, add to that uh, the lack of electricity, because uh, we have uh, higher prices uh, of fuel, we can't even use the generators. And this impacted the poorer community in the country. The uh, electricity problem is a third problem. We have lack of, uh, of electricity for long hours. We know that the schools in Lebanon make use of electricity in order uh, to have lighting in the classrooms and uh, to have generators. And this impacts uh, the children's study at home because there is no electricity in their houses. So they, of course, uh, need, uh, will face some difficulties physically and psychologically and a real threat of the sustainability of education, a real risk. I would like to remind you of the explosion in the port of Beirut that uh, took place in August 2020, uh, damaging 280 schools in addition to corona pandemic pandemic and uh, the remote uh, learning uh, highlighting lots of uh, uh, problems uh, uh, in the education system and real risks that uh, uh, threaten the sustainability of education and the quality of education. A large number of uh, children uh, did not learn um, uh, partially uh, or primitively, I can say, for a short period of time. So we have a real problem now. All these factors together uh, led uh, 2,000 teachers uh, highly qualified to migrate, to leave the country because they couldn't take it anymore without any financial support from the government. Uh, sh Truly shocking. Um, and can you say more about of the teachers? How have they responded to help keep learning going in these tough circumstances? By the end of February in 2017, uh, when there were warnings uh, um, of corona, sorry, talking about the uh, year 2020 in March, uh, they, uh, we, we closed the schools and we opted for remote learning. But the efficiency of remote learning was bound to, to several factors, access to internet, 
knowledge of the teachers, of the skills needed to uh, have remote teaching, and uh, the parents and uh, care providers' uh, uh, knowledge of these uh, situations. Some teachers depended on the internet fully uh, through having direct classrooms uh, through one of uh, the technological applications. Second part, uh, uh, sent videos uh, to the learners, uh, to the children at homes, and a third type uh, opted for the educational TV channel in coordination with the government. As a personal experience, I can tell you uh, uh, we in Save the Children uh, uh, team, uh, we responded through raising awareness of corona uh, virus and sending simple messages uh, to the families and caregivers on uh, the how to avoid uh, contacting uh, uh, COVID and also some uh, uh, psychological and social uh, activities that can be implemented by parents and children. We sent uh, these uh, text through WhatsApp, and the team uh, in Save the Children sent some educational packages to the children. The success of remote learning in Save the Children was uh, uh, happening because of several factors. First, because of the training we got. Second, the interaction um, um, with from the families was very good, especially facing the big difficulties we have in Lebanon. Let me give you a quick example. For example, having one telephone uh, in the family uh, to be used by the child in order to learn. And of course, we lack the interactive environment. Just a bit more about the impact on, on teachers specifically that you're seeing. No. The economic collapse shed light on the uh, learning sector and on teachers in particular because of the collapse of the value of the Lebanese lira. Uh, many uh, teachers migrated, left the country in the absence of any psychological and financial uh, support. The teachers found themselves facing real problems. Some private uh, schools uh, stopped paying teachers their salaries, and many uh, teachers were sacked. And in the government schools, the uh, teachers are still being paid, but the value of their salaries went down drastically. Thank you so much, Nagam. I, I know we're short of time, but just hearing that makes me have even more respect for teachers than I think we had already. So thank you very much. And Andrew, back to you. Huge thank round you. of applause, please, for Nagam. If you look... If you look in her bio on the Rewired app, Nagam has a philosophy for teaching, and it's simple. Students do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. I think that's a huge motto for all of us to be living by. They promised me a wireless mic, so apologies. The picture, therefore, is clear. Emmanuel, Rashmi, Charlotte and Nagam have made the example for us all to engage in the triple C approach, constant co-creation with and for teachers. Our hope on this panel for everyone around the world is to do one big thing for the future of education. How might you make your eight-minute conversation with a teacher in every week or at least every month in your respective work. Look how much we have learned in each of these eight-minute conversations. Truly together, as a global conversation of teachers and senior leaders in education policy, research, and practice, this is how we rewire education. I thank everyone globally. 
on stage and you in the room for standing up for teachers and making sure that they matter most. Enjoy the rest of the Rewired Summit and thank you very much. Thank you.